Science is not gendered. Good science is not gendered, no. People are people, I think, generally speaking, and I think one of the things I've found increasingly is that people offer their skills. What you have a role and responsibility to do is to cultivate and try and really develop those critical skills that they have and work on those areas where they're not so strong. I, I generally like to, to not see it as gender specific. I think people bring their talents to our work environment irrespective of their gender. And what we can do and what we have a responsibility of doing is actually to um, really try and create environments where they can exploit their talents. Mm, regardless of regardless gender. Regardless of gender, absolutely. I'm very focused on finding the gaps in our community who are not particularly engaged with science and it's been seen as, as potentially not a feminine thing to do and, and as a bit nerdy and, you know, a bit hard. And that's what we are very focused on is not so much being gender specific but being non-gender specific and saying Everybody, every child, every family, every parent, every grandparent, every sibling, this is something for everyone to participate in um, because the discovery of the world around us is not gender specific. So if we can concentrate on the ideas and not the person, then we can change how science is perceived. And obviously the more people we have of different backgrounds and genders, or you know, different gender, presenting science to the general public, the wider their view of what a scientist is will become. When you ask someone to picture a scientist, the image they frequently describe is one of an older white male in a lab coat. And if we look back through history, the most famous and noticeable scientists are male. The gender gap in science between women and men is still high, especially as you climb to higher levels of seniority. A common theme that was identified by the advocates in this episode is the importance to showcase female scientists and their accomplishments. Trying to shift the imbalance of power in senior roles within the field of science involves innovation and new ways of approaching expectations of workers. Some of the major STEM employers in Australia are now leading the way, looking at ways to attract and retain women after they have children, as this is cited as one of the key reasons for the drop of women in senior roles. Ultimately, this must mean devising family-friendly policies that are available to both parents, so men can also share the family responsibilities. UNESCO, among other agencies, including the European Commission and the Association of Academics and Societies of Sciences in Asia, have been outspoken about the underrepresentation of women in STEM fields globally. So where are we losing girls along the science career path? And what steps can we take to help turn this around? Look, the truth is, some scientists are male with crazy hair. And some science scientists are female with crazy hair. And some scientists are male and female with not crazy hair. And some scientists are very young and some scientists are very old. And uh, the full diversity exists. But I guess, historically, a lot, not all, but many of the very famous scientists or the, one that pe the ones that people recognise or remember happen to be those older males. We just need to keep role modelling um, how it is. We need to continue to communicate the messages that science is in everything that we do. I think everybody has some responsibility there. You know, certainly these days running our communications and marketing team, we think about it from a visibility perspective. You know, have we showcased all of the people in our building? You know, are we making sure that we provide opportunities for people whose first language isn't English? You know, are we making sure that people of colour are represented? Are we gender diverse in the kinds of things that we're putting out? Are we, um, 
are we sexuality diverse? You know, I think that these, these are things that we actively think about, but I do wonder if everybody actively thinks about it. You know, we see marketing campaigns and things make it to the press that shows that they don't. You know, the media has, has a responsibility to play and I don't think that they, they take that responsibility seriously enough. We still see the same kind of people um, turning up in media stories and they still like to push for the same kind of angles. You know, even in science, we, we work hard to say, hey, you know, it would be great to, to showcase this person who actually did the research as opposed to the person that you think you would like to speak to. It's often not so much that girls and women aren't entering the science field, it's what happens in the mid-career uh, echelons where they don't then go on to achieve the seniority that males often do. That's one of the big stumbling blocks. I guess what I noticed now and what I didn't notice then was that a good majority of the leaders everywhere around me were male. Um, and then I guess the, the, the longer I got through the process, the more I realised that the women around me were sort of disappearing. I think where you come into play when you start to see differences in senior leadership roles amongst females and males within science in particular, it really comes down to that lost time when, when people take time off for, for maternity leave. So creating working environments which are actually really supportive of young mums is something that I actually hold really dear because I think um, they do an enormous amount in terms of their creative and uh, capability profile that adds so much value to your research environment. The actual upside to that is that they then are aware that they have your full support but they also feel safe and they feel secure and that's really important I think in terms of getting the best out of people. Some women and I know some men but you know we tend to suffer from that thing called imposter syndrome you know are we really good enough? Do we really belong here? It's that sense of, of lack of confidence because sometimes when you're surrounded by that lack of diversity in anything, you don't have a sense of confidence that you belong. We think it's actually important that we recognise that we all have roles and responsibilities outside of the work environment that certainly do impact our work, but if we're actually open to the idea that we have a dialogue, we are able to, to say, well, we, we, we make, we'll make it work, I mean, we, and we do, we just make it work. That's mm. as simple as that, really. It's, it's, it, I, I, wish it was, I wish it was more science behind it, but the truth is it's just about a willingness to actually make it work. And I think we've been rewarded richly by the fact that we've created an environment that is really supportive of people doing what they can, when they can. If we're talking about sharing the jobs of the future in a more um, equal way between men and women, um, then we have to be talking about sharing everything else in life. It's okay to be flexible, it's okay to evolve, it's okay to change. I'm delighted to say that increasingly we're seeing even males take paternity leave and it's something that I think we should as a community encourage. So that's a shared responsibility. And then arguably both genders take a hit to their career trajectory. You know, an incredible amount has changed in, in time, but I think we need to recognise that uh, males are often feel the, the pressure of actually having to be, you know, leaders in their work. They need to go up that, that, that slippery pole. Um, and so they've, they've got challenges of a different kind, but they still relate to gender. And there's an expectation management issue that we need to wrestle with and reconcile, I think. I think we all have, a, as a community, have a responsibility around that. Hey, if, if a guy wants to take off 12 months for paternity leave and allow, you know, and then have his, have, have his partner go back to work, that's cool. You know, that's, that's what it should be. I mean, we should just sort of make every option available, I think is really what I, I would see as being the best outcome for, for our community. I like my work and I like to be good at it and yet it wasn't even a conversation that I had with my husband when I had children it was just I just expected myself that I'm I will be the person that works less and looks after the kids you know and that's it's almost came as a shock when I worked that out like you know I didn't even consider that we should have that conversation so it's it's hard because you you do you sacrifice maybe where you'd be at with your career and then you're trying to juggle everything and it almost gets trickier than that because, you know, work defines us as well. And particularly, I think, boys grow up 
expecting that they're, you know, that they will be defined by their job. They will be a builder, they will be whatever it is, that will be them. And I was reading some research recently that said that um, men that earn less than their partners uh, have more anxiety and feel less content than those, you know, the other way around. So that's, you know, that's a huge shift to try and think about how do we um, make sure that we're not, that we're supporting both, you know, mm. men and women to feel like they are confident and doing what they need to do to fulfil their self-worth. It's tricky because we know that the disadvantage that happens in, in science and technology and engineering and mathematics and medicine and we know that the disadvantage happens super early, like well beyond the sort of things that are happening at university. We know that that decisions that kids make in schools are, are impacting this. We know that experiences that young people have from their parents and from the people around them are different. And so that's hard. That means you have to change a lot of conversations. You know, the, the amazing stories of what scientists look like need to be different. I'm pretty um, conscious of my role in making sure that I'm being a good role model and providing experience to both boys and girls, but particularly girls and empowering them because there's research out there that shows that um, as of, you know, you get to about 11 and that feeling of self-efficacy and confidence in science really drops off for girls. There is some research around that talks about uh, girls need to be involved in science by the time they're seven or eight. They need to be switched on to science by that time. So we're hoping that getting them involved early on and them seeing how much fun science is and how they can be good at it and it can be very engaging for them, uh, that they will continue that as they get older. Education is a great leveller. It really is the thing that provides us with an opportunity to see everyone being equal and education goes to so many social benefits. We were looking for a program for preschoolers, children aged three to five, and so we devised this program and wanted it to be in the community setting. So we approached our local library and they said, yes, let's trial it, and it's gone from there. I don't see a difference in the genders of the kids, how they respond. It's more a difference in their personality. You've got rowdy girls and rowdy boys. You've got shy girls and shy boys. It's not whether they're boys or girls, it's more their personality that affects how they respond. And in the Little Bangs, we are trying to encourage them to have thoughts of their own, to share those thoughts with their, their adult who's there, and to be able to talk to us, to the group about it. The Little Bang Discovery Club getting the girls interested and excited and not seeing themselves as, you know, this is, that's a boy thing. Just kids come in and enjoy it. That sets them up well as a foundation. And then it's really important that um, we pre present in school, follow that interest on, that excitement and um, provide really strong um, examples and, and role modelling to our girls to make sure that they are not dropping off in the primary years feeling like it's not something they can do. You can certainly see the benefit for the kids. Um, science is a pretty big part of, of what they're going to be doing going forward so um, for them to be able to have their eyes open to, to science and being at, uh, getting it made exciting for them I think it's, um, it's pretty positive for them as they approach school. Nelly is a real um, little go-getter. She likes to have a go and do things herself. So she's definitely got more confidence when it comes to even just like pouring, um, pouring water, measuring things at home. Like if we're cooking, she wants to do it all herself. Just her little mind, I think, has been opened up in that, you know, oh, can we do that as an experiment? Or look at the colour of that changing when we put this in here. And she's just... Um, yeah, she's just really enjoyed the program and it's, um, it's been a lot, of, a lot of fun. And it sounds like for you as well, like even just watching you talk about that. Yeah, yeah it's just fun to do it with her and watch her. Um, she certainly doesn't, she's, she's going, she thinks outside the square. 
Do you think these programs, I mean, we're talking kids that are starting these programs from three years old. Do you think that the little bang and, and programs like that actually makes a difference for that? I think so. I think like um, later on they'll be dealing with um, science uh, on a higher level, but it introduces them to some of the learnings that, you know, that, that will just, they'll get uh, deeper into it as, as it goes on. But I, yeah, I think it's great. Some of the experiments you see, they're, they're, they're very simple, but they're, they just get a little bit harder as they go along and then as they develop and it, it definitely make things easier for them to understand as they get into, you know, primary school and then into high school for sure. Historically, um, you know, the mum stays home and the dad goes to work. Um, my husband is happy to come to things with his daughters like this. He uh, enjoys the interaction and yeah, he is in the minor minority when it comes to these sorts of things, but you know, you just got to encourage them to get out there and then one, one dad comes and the next one comes. We learn from our, our families, our parents, and we learn from our history. And so it's about a bit of a diversion from that history and actually recognising that, hey, we actually don't need to look in the past as to how we did things, but to the future and how best to do things. Girls are not seeing, you know, how that can fit into their lives. Now it happens that we're an all-female science faculty at our school. So maybe it's, you know, that the girls are saying, well, you know, there's all these female science teachers, there's, there's people that I can relate to that look like me, or that I will look, and I, I'm, you know, I can see myself in that future involving science. And I don't think as a society we're doing a very good job or in education of finding those hooks for girls, making it relevant to them. And, and I think it's probably deeply ingrained that, mm -hmm. you know, oh, girls just don't like physics or, oh, girls are just not that into coding. I didn't realise that I was a woman in STEM or a girl in science or any one of these things. But when I look back on it, I realised that there were just two girls in our year 11 chemistry class. I didn't, but I certainly didn't notice at the time. And so I don't think I'd, I even noticed that I was a woman in STEM until people started saying, oh, do you want to speak at this women, you know, you're still here, you're doing great things, do you want to speak at this women in STEM event? And all of a sudden I was like, does this make me unique? Like, is this, is this even something we need to talk about? And then I sort of watched what was happening to people around me and realised that actually it was a huge issue. We spent a lot of time saying, hey, they're awesome because they're still here. And like, that's not a conversation worth having in science. Like, we should be saying, hey, have you seen this amazing leukaemia research? We're off track because we're having to spend so much time talking about how we can fix these things. And, you know, I think the challenge is that the solutions are tricky. You know, we, there, if there was, you know, these are really smart people. Um, and so if there was a really good, simple solution, we would have already been there. Mm. Um, it's a massive shift, isn't it, to think, OK, let's not just go look at the package of the, oh, you're a boy, you'd like this, you're a girl, but actually, what is your personality? What are your likes? What are your dislikes? And work from there. But it's really tricky, especially in um, areas that have low diversity, like country areas. If you haven't seen it, if you, if you don't have someone that you think, oh, I'd like to be like them and they've done that, then it's really hard to um, you know, aspire to something that you haven't seen yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a constant battle in country areas where you can't just visit a city or whatever to broaden horizons of career options full stop and then, you know, where boys and girls fit within imagining themselves in that. People keep asking and I, you know, I say these days, I really just don't want to go to those events anymore. Like I, I want to work out how we can showcase the amazing things that are happening and showcase diversity, but without having to have the conversation because it's exhausting. You know, I've, I've described it as being you know, we, people say that they're a tire, tireless advocate for something and I'm like, I'm a tired advocate. You do a little more and you, you know, you work a little harder at it despite the fact that you don't have that much left in the tank, you know, but you feel like you have to because if you don't, who will? And, you know, you certainly don't want the next generation to have to be burdened by the same things that you were burdened by. And it, it would be lovely to be in that space. And so, you know, the more conversations we have and the, the more conversations we have really broadly and widely with everybody, I think the, the better off we're going to be. In speaking with our advocates, there was a great range of hope for the future for seeing more women in science. 
Programs like the Little Bang Discovery Club are helping children from a young age to discover a love of science, regardless of gender. Increased workplace flexibility and a shifting of what we perceive as traditional parenting roles is seen as critical to help keep more females in science through middle to upper management. But we also encountered a level of fatigue from the advocates who are frequently called on to push this agenda. This demonstrates that we need to share the load and have more widespread conversation with more people engaging to help shift the gender gap of women in science. Join us in episode four, where we take a look at female representation in competitive sport. We speak to a number of women and men who are working to increase the current undervaluation of women in sport and why they believe it's so important that we do so. To stay connected and informed as we roll out this series, please like us on our Facebook page and you can re-watch an episode at any time via our website or also via the Channel 44 website.